A cold plunge is like Viagra for your body. It improves your insulin sensitivity. It improves your metabolism. It stimulates mitobiogenesis. And that improves the male sexual function. People are writing to me about multiple sclerosis and saying, I was in a wheelchair. I started ice baths. Now I'm running 10 Ks. We need to understand this metabolic mechanism so much better. Fewer than 5% of the adults older than 45 years old had any detectable brown fat at all. And that's because they were no longer getting cold. We live in these comfortable worlds. But what most women don't realize is that testosterone is the dominant sex hormone in women. Typical 20 something has half the testosterone that a typical 20 something would have had 20 years ago. You know, they'll say, <laughs> I haven't had morning wood like this in, you know, since I was in my 20s. Is this normal? The suicide rates have gone up. The rates of major depression have gone up and not by a little. Drug overdoses have gone up. The real pandemic is in mental health. Can we reverse aging process? I think I've reversed mine. Um, but let's make a distinction. There is the chronological age, you know, the number of days since your birthday. And there's no sense talking about reversing chronological age. That's not what we mean. What we mean is biological age. The only meaningful measure of biological age is mortality. That is years of life expectancy. And there's a number of ways that people are trying to measure this by examining the material in the body. So this would be DNA methylation, or this would be telomere length. They want to look at the materials and say, are these materials exhibiting characteristics of less or fewer life years expected? And I don't think that's the way to do it. I've looked at the data on telomeres and DNA methylation and other material measures, and I don't think they're reliable at all. I don't think they're an improvement on chronological age. Any measure of biological age must be associated with an improved estimate of life expectancy. But Patrick Porter, he's at BrainTap, and he does an energetic measure of biological age. So he's not measuring material. He's not taking a saliva or a blood sample. He's measuring the energy that your body produces. You know that energy comes from the mitochondria. It is the mitochondria that convert food energy, whether that's glucose or fats, into the kind of energy that our muscles use or, or our tissues need for wound repair or that we need for cold thermogenesis. So when he measures your energy, he's measuring the quality of your mitochondrial throughput. So I got into his neurocheck device, it's called, and um, you know I was 50 two or three at the time. And he's going through his screens, looking at the results. He says, Tom, you're 32 years old. And what that meant is, you know, I had to look it up later. What that meant is I had something like 55. I don't remember exactly, but let's say it's 55 years that I would expect to live. It doesn't mean I'm chronologically 30. It means that I have the same life expectancy as a 32 year old at that time. So when you take what I was, uh, 53 plus another 55 years, that's 108 years is, is what Patrick Porter's measure would suggest. And to some people, 108, it sounds preposterous. But think about it for a second. My Nana, she lived until she was 99. And so I'm thinking, huh, could I beat Nana by nine years? Why not? I mean, it seems when I think about how long my Nana lived, 108 doesn't seem so unreasonable. I saw Patrick a few years later. He came to Phoenix and he's at a conference. He said, Tom, let's get you in the you know, neuro check again. I said, sure. It's been a couple of years. Maybe I'm 34. He said, no, congratulations. You're 30. But in that time, my biological age had come down according to his neuro check. And all that means is my life expectancy, my expected life years had continued to go up. I don't look like I'm 30. I don't run around like I'm 30. This biological age is only a measure of expectation of life years left. The quality of those years is probably more important than the quantity of those years. When you take this energetic measure that Patrick is using, 
what it's saying is I have an excellent, uh, he would say energetic state. He's got other words for it, but my metabolism is doing fantastic. It is the mitochondrial theory of aging. It is the energy that they convert that allows you to, to repair defects in the DNA that fuels every metabolic, that fuels life itself. This is what I think creates those high quality vital years for me and why and now that I'm going to be 58 this year, I still feel great, much better than when I weighed 250 pounds and I was 42 years old and I didn't have the energy that I have now. So I'm going to keep it up. And, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll beat Nana and I won't ever be in her wheelchair. So Patrick's test, what does it actually measure? Like, does it measure the um, efficacy in which your body converts uh, energy like what 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 is the, the measure of he will take an eeg reading and so uh the first thing that's happening is he's looking at your heart rate and then he'll pass as far as my understanding a weak current through your body to assess the strength of your energetic production that is the energy field that your body produces at different frequencies Patrick hasn't explained to me the technology by which this works. I'm an engineer and I'm very curious. And I'm like, okay, what voltage, you know, uh, what current, uh, how is this sensing? You know, I have all these physics questions. Patrick's doctorate is in psychology. And he says, well, look, the software takes the stuff and I compare you to, you know, 10,000 other people that I have in my database. And characteristically, the signal that I'm getting from you is consistent with the signals I get from 30 and 32 year olds. But he has yet to explain to me the physics of it. Okay, I see. So do you want to just take us back through your journey of life and how you actually stumbled across cold exposure? It started for me in 2001 when my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. He was six years old. I didn't know what was wrong with him. I thought he had the flu. My mother taught me, you know, when I was a kid, when you're sick, you give the kid orange juice. The vitamin C is supposed to help him get better. I was giving my child exactly the wrong thing. He kept getting sicker. And then finally, my wife called our neighbor. Um, you know, this was after Christmas. And um, we lived in northern New York. And our neighbor was also our pediatrician. She said, John, um, you know, he's not doing too good. He's got a fever and he's sleeping a lot. John said, it's probably just the flu. Then my wife said, and he's peeing the bed every night. John said, meet me in the hospital. Your son has diabetes. Your life is going to change. And so for the next 15 years, I kept scrupulous records of what he ate, how much exercise he got, how much insulin we were giving him, what type of insulin, when we gave it. I have still the journals. There's a stack of books everything that happened to my son's metabolism over the next decade and a half. And I learned that the advice you get from nutritions and dietitians and endocrinologists is mostly wrong because I had the data in his journals that said, uh, neoglucogenesis, this is something I had to learn. He would have zero carbs and I would still have to give him long acting insulin because his liver would produce glucose from the hamburgers and the cheese and whatever it was that he was eating. I didn't know about neoglucogenesis and neither did many of the nutritionists or the dietitians with whom we met. So we had to figure everything out for ourselves, do what worked for our son, despite what anybody else was saying. But then I found out I was so focused on his health that I'd let my own go to crap. My weight ballooned to like 250 pounds. My wife and I separated. I was living on my own and I knew I had to get serious about my health. I mean, what am I going to do? How am I going to date again? So I started eating better. I started exercising more and I was losing weight. And I got a male hormone health panel. You know, these are the things that you're supposed to do when you get into your 50s and you have some blood drawn. And they tell you what your cholesterol is doing and all those things. One of those things is the PSA, prostate specific antigen. And mine came back elevated. And so I got to go online and I got to read about something. What is this PSA? It turns out the PSA is associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. 
It means your prostate is inflamed, and that could be because of cancer, but it could be because of any number of things that are sort of normal for a man that age. But in my head, it's cancer. You know, your brain starts playing tricks on you, and I don't have to tell you because you've actually been through it, and I just had a bad blood test. So, you know, the advice on the internet is, um, well, when was your last prostate exam? Like, I haven't had a prostate exam. Are you kidding? I'm, I don't want to go to the doctor. I've been dodging doctors for 15 years. I promised my son that we would take care of him at home and he would never have to go back to the hospital because I felt so much shame of having treated him the wrong way, of not knowing what was going on. I said, we're going to figure this out together. I haven't had a prostate exam. And so the internet says, well, are you having difficulty urinating? And I became so self-conscious about my own urination that I started having difficulty urinating. And my head is going bonkers. I don't want to get a prostate exam because the next thing is going to be a biopsy. And the next thing is going to be a prostateectomy. I was talking with other men who had been down this road and it was awful. There was one man who had a sepsis infection that threatened his life as a result of his biopsy. There were several men who had prostatectomies and they were never going to have an erection again. And it was just something that they sort of accepted. They said, but I'm glad we caught it early. And here I am, I'm a single guy now. What woman is ever going to love me if I have no capacity to have an erection? You know, all these things are going through my head. I said, I'm not telling anybody. I'm not telling my daughter. I'm not telling my son. I'm not telling my wife. I'm not, I'm going to handle this on my own. I'm going to do everything I can to avoid the doctor's office or die trying. So that was keto. And that was ice baths. That's when I got really serious every day. I will get into that ice bath. And sure enough, I brought my PSA down from seven to eventually 1.5, which is normal, you know, no elevated risk. And so you can see how stubborn I already became and how I'd learned about metabolism because of my son's diabetes and how I'd already sort of trained myself to disbelieve what the doctors were saying. And so I'm going to do this myself, right? I got the PSA 1.5. That was good. And so I finally go to see the urologist. I'm thinking I'm going to clean bill of health at a pat on the back, a congratulations, right? For being so clever to have him. That's not what happened. I, I gave him my labs and he said, well, I want to do one more test. And I thought, you know, am I in trouble here? Did I, uh, is there still a risk? He said, well, you just get this one more number. He did not care about my PSA. I was totally in the clear, but he saw that my testosterone had gone through the roof. I was at 1180 nanograms per deciliter, which is too high. The lab report said I was, I had the testosterone of a 19 year old and he was about my age and he thought, this guy must be juicing. He must be injecting himself with testosterone. He must be doing something to elevate. He wanted to measure my luteinizing hormone. I didn't know what that was. Luteinizing hormone is what stimulates your gonads to make testosterone. So if your luteinizing is low, but your total testosterone is high, then the endocrinologist would say, hey, Professor Seeger, you better get off the TRT. You know, you're overdoing it here. <laughs> luteinizing hormone came back 8.9 way off the charts and I never heard from my urologist again and I haven't gone back you know I, I don't have prostate cancer I'm not worried about that I have extremely healthy testosterone levels what I've learned is there is no reason for a man's testosterone to decline with age we it's normal but that doesn't mean it has to be. I don't want to be normal. I'm ready to be abnormal because normal these days is in a state of chronic illness. When you take care of your metabolism, your metabolism will take care of your testosterone. So I check about once or twice a year now, and I'm not 1180, you know, I'm 1040. And many men are still saying 1040, that sounds great. For me, it's very healthy. Then a funny thing happened. Joe Rogan found my article. He read out an Instagram post, you know, but he's like, there's this guy and he has these testosterone levels because he does his ice bath before his exercise, which is the opposite of what everybody says you're supposed to do. So Joe's trying it and he goes, it's really hard, but I think it's working. Men started reading my articles and they started sending me their labs. And I'd say about 80% of the messages that I get they sound like, 
I think you found the cure for low T. You know, I tried your protocol. I got off TRT and I'm getting like 900 readings and I want to go higher. Some of them are saying it feels like I'm doing everything right and I'm stuck at 550. Now, I don't know. I mean, testosterone is both psychological and physiological, but there's some good science to support what happened to me, that the mechanism is cold exposure, cold stimulation. It doesn't even have to be whole body. You can do this with a cold shower. And then some exercise. It doesn't have to be a lot of exercise. It can be a brisk walk. It can be the stair climber. It can be, I do push-ups. I do pull-ups sometimes. I have my steel mace. There's a video of me on the internet, and that's my favorite one. But you don't have to lift heavy. And what happened to me is also happening to the men participating in these scientific studies. It's not a guarantee that it will work for everyone, but it is, there's no side effects except feeling wonderful. So why not give it a try and see what happens for you? When I went through the library and I wrote these articles, I discovered there was a lot more to it than testosterone. You can reverse Hashimoto's. You can reverse type 2 diabetes. There are even people who have gone from stage 4 terminal cancer to cancer-free by incorporating cold exposure into their life. Now, I just had a cancer scare. I never had a biopsy. I never had a definitive cancer diagnosis. But AJK, she's on Twitter. We've been dating now for seven years. She had a tumor on her liver. She was in the hospital, and this thing was four centimeters wide. And they told her it was inoperable because the liver is so, like, bloody. That is, there's so many blood vessels in the liver. They didn't want to cut it. She'd had a history of a bleeding disorder, and they were afraid that removing the tumor might be more dangerous than leaving it in place. So they said it's not the kind of thing that would respond to radiation or chemotherapy. She said, well, what shall we do? And they said, watchful waiting. It felt like a death sentence to her because she's like, watchful waiting? This tumor comes out of nowhere. What am I going to do? Just watch myself die? And I said, no, you're going to do what I did. You're going to do what Dean Hall did. You're going to go keto. You're going to get in the ice bath. You're going to attack this thing metabolically. She did that for three months, had another scan, and damned if that tumor didn't shrink. So I had to go back to the library and say, what are the mechanisms? Most tumors have a gene. There's something like 80% of tumors have a gene that is upregulated for glucose metabolism. So Thomas Seafried, he's at Boston University or Boston College. I get him confused. But in any case, he's written a book called uh, cancer as a metabolic disease. And he's really focused on ketones and glucose. And he shows that if you give mice with tumors implanted exogenous ketones, so they're eating the ketones, the ketones will inhibit the growth of the tumor. And for me, this is revolutionary, it changes the way that I think about cancer. The fastest way to stimulate ketone production in your body is an ice bath. So I'm reading about this and I'm thinking, this is something you've got to try and it works for her. New paper comes out of Sweden. This is Seki et al. And they didn't look at ketones. They just looked at cold. They took mice that they implanted tumors. These are laboratory mice and they are destined to die of cancer. That's why they're studying these mice. And they took those mice and they exposed some of them to cold air just for a few hours a day. And then the other ones are the control group. And sure enough, the cold air inhibited the growth of tumors and it extended the lives of the mice. So they wanted to know, how does this happen? Sure enough, they saw that the brown fat that was activated in these mice preferentially cleared glucose from the bloodstream, that the glucose was going into the brown fat and not into the tumor cell. The cold was starving the tumor cell of the glucose that it needed. They didn't stop there. They said, let's try this with a human. And so they took a Hodgkin's patient who had been through several rounds of chemo, but still had active tumor tissue, put this Hodgkin's patient in the cold, did the PET scan saying, where is the glucose going? And measured the preferential uptake of glucose from the bloodstream into the brown fat and not into the tumor, which is to say the mechanism doesn't just work in mice. It also works in human beings. So now you've got Seafried this metabolic theory of cancer that says cancer originates in the mitochondria, not in the nucleus. He's taken cancer cells, removed their mitochondria, replaced them with healthy mitochondria, and watched the DNA in the nucleus repair. 
So you've got Siegfried saying, here's the metabolic theory. And then you've got Secchi saying, by the way, we can starve tumor cells by using cold exposure and activating brown fat. If you've got cancer, what do you have to lose? Is, is what I'm saying mm. now. I don't have a cure for cancer and I don't have a remedy. What I have is the science and these stories from people who have seemingly miraculous recoveries from incurable cancer after they did cold exposure. Not every story that I get is so happy and they're not all over. But what do you have to lose? It seems now like a good idea to see if what works in some of the studies and what has worked for some of the other people can also work for you. Or in my case, me. Because nothing is more important than our own N equals one experience. It's interesting because earlier on, as you were talking about, you know, the conditions that you've heard it helped other people. There was a wide range of conditions. You've got uh, cancer, you've got um, diabetes, you've got autoimmune um, conditions. If cold exposure has got a positive effect on so many um, different conditions from different fields and different organs, for example, that are um, involved, there has to be a, a mechanism of action of really fundamental um, building blocks of humans. What Agreed. is that sort of that mechanism of action? Some people listen to me talk and they say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He makes ice baths sound too good to be true. And anything that's too good to be true has to be bull crap, you know? And what does he know anyway? He's an engineer. He's not a medical doctor. He's got no qualifications in the medical field. And I mean, they're entitled to say all of these things. They're all true. Ice baths do sound too good to be true. And you should be skeptical of anything that sounds like it's so powerful and so positive. And I have zero medical credentials. On the other hand, you know what else is too good to be true? Exercise. When you exercise, you extend your life expectancy. Your muscles get stronger. You get more energy. And exercise makes you smarter. Well, how does that happen? It's not like your brain was doing the push-ups, you know? Exercise improves your mental health. How, what, what? Exercise is like a miracle thing. It's too good to be true. And yet, there it is. The mechanism is the metabolism. If you do not get cold, you will lose your brown fat. There's a study at the Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York, and they went back and they looked at all the PET scans. And among the population that they'd scanned, we're talking thousands of people, fewer than 5% of the adults older than 45 years old had any detectable brown fat at all. And that's because they were no longer getting cold. We live in these comfortable worlds and we all know, yeah, I should work out more. Yeah, I should get more exercise. But few of us are saying, oh, I'm not giving my body the cold that my body is evolved to expect. The you know occasional cold exposure that it needs, it keeps me healthy and maintains my brown fat. And some people would say, well, that's no big deal. You know, what do you need brown fat for? Brown fat, that just does cold thermogenesis. It's true, brown fat, is the non-shivering cold thermogenesis organ. It will turn glucose and fats into heat to defend your core body temperature, but it does a lot more. It's also a secretory organ. Brown fat will produce more thyroid hormone than your thyroid does. Your thyroid and your brown fat, they work together to signal one another, to modulate one another's action. So if you lose all your brown fat, because you live in Phoenix or you live in Florida and you're not getting cold, your, brown, your thyroid can become dysregulated. Restoring your brown fat will modulate your thyroid. It will correct thyroid conditions of either hyper or hypo, that is overactivity or underactive thyroid, by bringing it the brown fat that it needs to modulate its activity. Brown fat will produce neuroprotective factors that prevent your brain, help it heal from injury or prevent your brain from declining into dementia. Brown fat is one of the best things you can do for mitobiogenesis. When you activate your brown fat, it will restore it will create new mitochondria. And it creates those new mitochondria by selecting the best quality mitochondria that you already have and reproducing those. 
So what is the mechanism by which, you know, the ice bath confers all these wonderful benefits? It is the metabolism. And we are learning more about autoimmune disorders. Things that we didn't think of as autoimmune are now classified as autoimmune disorders, whether that's fibromyalgia or rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, we knew about type 1 diabetes. We knew about uh, multiple sclerosis. We know about Parkinson's. And we're beginning to discover that all of these are related to aberrant immune function. The cold exposure also revs up the immune system. There is something that I haven't figured out between vitamin D, so your light exposure, and cold exposure, and metabolism, and the immune system, the kind of triggers that can cause the immune system to go haywire. But it was my son's diagnosis that really motivated me to learn about these things. In 2001, we didn't know. But a few years later, in Finland, they completed a longitudinal study. So 25 years. They tracked women who took vitamin D supplements during pregnancy and compared them to women who didn't. And then said, what is the rate of type 1 diabetes in those women who were vitamin D insufficient or deficient during pregnancy and the first year of life when they're breastfeeding their baby. And turns out type one diabetes is associated with that vitamin D deficiency. There's something about your light exposure. You know, in the Northern latitudes, you don't get a lot of light. Where's the vitamin D gonna come from? But you do get a lot of cold. And in a way, this keeps the immune system robust until the days get long again. There's something about the vitamin D, the cold, and the immune system that compensates for one another. And when one of these is unable to compensate for a deficiency in the other, things really go bust. And yet, I haven't finished, not by a long shot, like understanding the relationship between the immune system, vitamin D, or light exposure, and cold exposure. I've got to update my book with a new chapter or a new section on rheumatoid arthritis because people are telling me, I used to have RA, then I started ice baths, and now I don't. People are writing to me about multiple sclerosis and saying, I was in a wheelchair, I started ice baths, now I'm running 10Ks. We need to understand this metabolic mechanism so much better so that we can leverage it for all of these, what people are saying, chronic disorders, incurable degenerative diseases that now we're finding people sometimes can reverse. Mm. What I found particularly fascinating about your work and the articles that you write on your Substack is the connection between the cold exposure and fertility. And the reason why this, this really caught my attention is because I'm particularly interested in interviewed few people talking about the population collapse that we're going into and the fact that our birth rates are falling. Now, Stephen Shaw, in his research, came up um, with the data that suggests that mothers are still having the same number of children as they did 50, 60 years ago, but there is the, the rate of women that don't become mothers have ex has exploded in the last 50, 60 years. So that's why we are seeing the lower fertility rates or the play. That's why most countries are below the replacement rates. And when he then started digging deeper, most women become childless, not by choice, but by circumstance. Just when they were getting their career together, for example, you know, then they were starting to get ready to get to start a family, their relationship fell apart. It's circumstance that means that people don't get to become the parents even though they wanted to. So when I started looking at the cold exposure and how that potentially could help, I see that as potential avenue for people that have left it a little bit later in their life to start a family. I'm one of these people, certainly. And they still want to give it a go without necessarily going down the IVF route. So do you want to talk to me a little bit about the impact of cold exposure on female fertility? And then we will sort of jump into the male fertility as well. This is a big problem, especially in my field in the university. So among academics and faculty, 
Women uh, may aspire to a faculty career. And so perhaps they enter grad school when they're uh, 22. And it could take six or seven years to get a PhD in engineering. But in the sciences, you typically also have to do a postdoc. So we're just going to say eight years. Now they're 30 years old. And perhaps they've met a man that they're in love with. But because they want to have a faculty career, a number of their mentors will say, honey, before you have kids, you should finish your PhD. Before you have kids, you should finish tenure. You know, the children are so demanding and they're so interrupting to your career that you should really reach that level of security that tenure provides before you go ahead and have a family and then, you know, have a couple of kids and it'll be great. But do the math. If they went straight into grad school, did a doctorate, did a year or two as a postdoc, started a faculty position at the age of 30, tenure can take seven years. Now they're 36 and they're 37 before they're saying, okay, I'm ready. The man has to be patient the entire time, right? And men have more time. So, or maybe she's marrying yeah. a man who's older and that's fine. But when she's 36 or seven, now her OBGYN is saying, well, you know, you're gonna be a geriatric pregnancy. Geriatric? What are you talking about? It's not like I'm getting an AARP car. I don't get a senior citizen discount on the bus or something. Don't tell me I'm geriatric. And then they'll roll out the statistics and they'll say, well, you have to understand it's very rare for a 37 year old woman to conceive. And then it's rare for her to carry the baby to term. And then the rate of, of adverse birth outcomes, birth defects and things. like. So we have to monitor you very closely. They might even put her on bed rest, you know, for the last four months, the last half of the pregnancy. They might tell her a lot of things that sound like they would assuage her fears, but aren't good for her at all. Just like men do not have to decline in testosterone as they get older. Women who maintain a metabolic vitality, a metabolic health, do not have to decline into their late 30s in their fertility. It's just that it's normal. It is normal for women and men to accumulate the insults to their mitochondria, whether that's seed oil or poor sleep habits or poor light hygiene, that their mitochondria can't keep up. And by the time they're in their late 30s, they already have some degree of insulin resistance. They already have some degree of mitochondrial degradation. It is the metabolism that encroaches upon their fertility, not their chronological age. And so it's no surprise. There's a woman who's a medical doctor who reversed her own Hashimoto's. Her name is Courtney Hunt. She's in here in Scottsdale and she treats patients for their metabolism. And she says, I got to give you ladies a warning. You know, I don't care if you're 39 or 42. When you start working with me, you might become pregnant. If you're not ready for that, you have to take other precautions. And her patients will sometimes say, oh no, my OBGYN says, no, I'm done. You know, I'm gonna be perimetopausal. And it, she's had 44 year olds under her care become pregnant and carry a healthy baby to term, have a natural childbirth because she's getting them metabolically ready, whether they know it or not. So that's what's going on with women, protein. Uh, cold exposure, exercise, all of these things will help keep a woman healthy. But when I think about the different ways to damage your mitochondria, they're all incorporated in our regular industrialized lives. Seed oils is kind of the hidden mitochondrial insult. Seed oils aren't just for energy. That is, fats are incorporated into our body as materials. It is the fats that make up the membranes and the cells and mitochondria are organelles that exist inside each cell. And the membrane of the mitochondria is made up of fats. When you give your body the wrong type of fats, you get the wrong type of membrane and that uh, slows down the action of insulin. That interferes with the mitochondrial function. So you've got seed oils, You've got light exposure. Melatonin is one of the, it's probably the most powerful of your body's antioxidants. It turns out that your mitochondria make their own melatonin. 
And they do that so that when they're really revving up high exercise or high thermogenesis, the melatonin will donate electrons to these stray reactive oxygen species that would otherwise damage the mitochondrial DNA. The melatonin that the mitochondria produce protect the mitochondria from that damage when they're working really hard. If you don't get the right light cycle, you can damage your mitochondria. And too many carbs without a break. I mean, I'll eat a dessert. Uh, Thanksgiving comes along in the United States and I'm going to eat the whole damn pumpkin pie. And then I'll do an ice bath. I'll clear some of that glucose out and I'll give my mitochondria a break, whether it's intermittent fasting or one meal a day or a multi-day fast. It gives your mitochondria a chance to come back. These are the kinds of things that women can do to maintain their fertility. Once they become pregnant, get the sauna right out of your life. The heat is not associated with good birth outcomes. So stop doing the sauna, stop doing the Wim Hof hyperventilation breath work, but keep up with the cold because maintaining insulin sensitivity is gonna be important for reducing your inflammation, for maintaining a healthy metabolism, for improved mobility especially as you go later in pregnancy and it feels more difficult to exercise, you feel like, well, I don't wanna walk anymore. I'm not gonna do this Stairmaster anymore. You can still keep your metabolism in tune by getting in the ice bath for a couple of minutes. So those are the ladies. And, then, and we can follow up on that. Like it's a good time to get your reactions before we move on to the men. Um, I mean, I think for me, like I've started obviously doing the cold exposure for completely different reasons. For me, it was more, I wanted to feel a little bit more upbeat. I wanted to get the mental health, just motivation, feel good um, feeling that you get after the, after the cold exposure. What I really was not, I, I, I just, I wasn't even aware that the cold exposure can basically combat and help with these pesky things that you get towards the pregnancy, like you said, the, the swelling, the preeclampsia, and they monitor you for that towards the end of the pregnancy. Cause so they know that most women are going to get those problems towards the end. So it's very, very um, interesting to see how that changes. And obviously I've already had um, one baby. We are trying for another one. And I, I would love to, compare the difference between the first pregnancy that was um, completely without any cold exposure really and then the second pregnancy that um, hopefully is going to be with it so um, that's really interesting let's turn to boys because I think sometimes when we are talking about fertility men are being overlooked but in terms of the data just in case um, men feel like we are being sexist here in terms of the data, it is actually very difficult to track male fertility um, because you can technically father a child, you know, at the age of 70, if you're really, if you're really lucky. Um, so tracking the men's fertility is a little bit different. Um, so that's why the men are not usually sort of included in the conversation. But it is definitely the problem for men as well who for some reason you know haven't become a father as yet so what can cold exposure do to men one of the earliest clinical signs of metabolic disorder in men is erectile dysfunction and i'm going to explain why um but before i explain why we're going to talk about how serious this is because testosterone levels are going down and not by a little bit. The typical 20 something has half the testosterone that a typical 20 something would have had 20 years ago. It's complicated to say. That is, um, young men today have testosterone levels that would be typical of older men in the past. And that's how fast testosterone is declining. And you say, well, that's testosterone. Sperm counts going down, sperm motility going down. The, the fertility of all these male measures are going down. But the one that hits men hardest that is going up is the rate of erectile dysfunction. And it is because of metabolic disorder. It used to be that doctors thought you didn't really need mitochondria to get an erection. The um, blood vessels 
are controlled by smooth muscle tissue. These smooth muscles, are, they wrap around the blood vessel. And when the smooth muscles contract, that's vasoconstriction. It shuts the blood off. And when they uh, relax, that's vasodilation. It allows the blood to flow. The smooth muscle tissues are signaled by what are called endothelial cells that line the blood vessels. The endothelial cells, they don't have a lot of mitochondria. And so most medical doctors are like, well, you know, if they don't have a lot of mitochondria, they must function without making ATP. They must function through other metabolic mechanisms. And that turned out to be false. There's been a couple or three papers that show it is the mitochondria that power the endothelial cells to produce nitric, sorry, nitric oxide that signals these smooth muscle tissues. So you need mitochondria in the endothelial cells to do vasoconstriction and vasodilation. An erection requires a little bit of both. Vasodilation that opens up the blood vessels, allows the blood pressure the heart is generating to flood the penis and create the erection, but vasoconstriction on the other side to you know, keep the blood where it needs to be. When the endothelial cells have damaged mitochondria, they are incapable of producing enough energy to signal the smooth muscle tissues to do the job that is required of them. This is why erectile dysfunction is one of the earliest clinical signs of metabolic disorder. It is a mitochondrial dysfunction that is leading to erectile dysfunction. Now, there can also be um, psychological issues for certain, but we're talking about a physiological or sorry, um, we're talking about a man's incapacity to get the erections that are not associated with, uh, it could be stress or fear or other psychological issues that's on the rise. So how does Viagra work? Viagra overcomes insulin resistance. It forces more work out of the mitochondria. It pushes the glucose in there so that they can produce the nitric oxide and boom, now you get the erection. And Viagra works for women too. Women have erectile tissues. It's just not as obvious and it's not as essential for this reproductive act. Viagra overcoming the insulin resistance means it has other therapeutic uses besides treating erectile dysfunction. It can be used, for example, to promote brain healing in natal, that is in newborns who've experienced brain injury. But what it doesn't do is fix your mitochondria. It overcomes the insulin resistance that is protecting the mitochondria from further damage. It works not in promotion of the mitochondria, but perhaps at the expense. Ben Greenfield says, a cold plunge is like Viagra for your body. It improves your insulin sensitivity. It improves your metabolism. It stimulates mitobiogenesis. And that improves the male sexual function. Now, I get a lot of kidding about this because, you know, on Seinfeld, they have an episode called shrinkage. The cold water, it causes the testicles to shrink up into the body where they can stay warm. And it causes the penis to shrink. And so there's, you know, lots of funny jokes and some good internet videos. And I get a lot of direct messages from men in private because men don't talk anywhere near about enough about this. And they'll say, Professor Seeger, um, you know, I'm 60 years old, but I'm waking up in the middle of the night with an erection. Is that normal? And I go, it is if you're doing ice baths, you know, <laughs> they'll say, I haven't had morning wood like this. And, you know, since I was in my twenties, is this normal? And I'll say, how long have you been doing ice baths? You know, and then every once in a while, it'll be like, my wife is really angry at you. Why? Well, because I read all your articles and now she's tired. I have promised AJ that I will not do anything that further increases my testosterone because she says, sometimes I can't keep up and, and that's all normal. Like it's all healthy. Good for me. Good for these men. It's good for fertility. I'm, I'm not going to have kids with it. I can't wait to be a granddad, you know, but I'm not at that stage where I'm not in a relationship where we're going to, you know, we've got seven kids between us. It's more than enough. But the men who are um, grappling with ED don't want to talk about it because 
men don't talk about health issues. And so they're going to do it in private or the studies that you said, there aren't enough studies. They're all coming out of Denmark because Denmark has such liberal um, policies for sperm donation. Turns out that you can get sperm samples from Denmark and you have good information on age and things like this. And so you can run some studies, but we can't assume that what happens to young men in Denmark is representative of what's happening to an older population in the United States. So we don't have anywhere near enough good data on what's going on with men and how to fix it. I have my own N equals one experience. I have the text messages from other men and I have the science, uh, the metabolism of an erection and of sperm production and testosterone that are all pointing us in the direction of have an ice bath. Keep up a regular practice of cold exposure. Activate your brown fat to keep your metabolism healthy. And your uh, fertility is going to thank you for this practice. Now, I think for men as well, like the tes testosterone is not just for, for, the, for the fertility, but that is the hormone that seems to be getting giving you guys the sort of that oomph, you know, the, the, the motivation to do things, to be a man, you know, out of there and do the manly things and feel like you can get into the world and, and, and smash it, basically do whatever you want with your dreams. So it was, it was interesting as just as I sort of look at few podcasters that are quite big, but there, they did their test of the testosterone. It came, pretty low they then did x amount of different measures um and it wasn't all about cold exposure different people were doing different paths but their reported well-being um libido and just the sort of the oomph for life has just gone through the roof since they sorted out their testosterone now i saw one of your posts where it looked at the difference between men and women when it comes to the how their testosterone um, reacts to cold exposure. Do we know the mechanism of action? And can you just talk us through that? Because I found it really fascinating. There has not been anywhere near enough science done on women, testosterone and cold. I found only one study. They use the cold presser test, which is just a cold stimulation. You put one hand, usually the non-dominant hand in a bowl of ice water. What happened to men was testosterone went down, but women salivary testosterone, they got a boost. And so this is a very different reaction. They did not ask the women where they were in their menstrual cycle. And so the testosterone in women is produced in the ovaries. It's really important to know where you are in your cycle as a woman to understand sort of what's a healthy level of testosterone for me, because obviously your ovaries are going to be more active at different times in your cycle than other times. But what most women don't realize is that testosterone is the dominant sex hormone in women. Healthy women have three to four times the testosterone coursing through their veins than they have estrogen. When you get a lab report back, the testosterone and the estrogen are reported in different units and the estrogen is a bigger number. And so you're like, oh, well, that's normal. You don't have more estrogen. But once you convert the units, no, you have more testosterone. No, nowhere near the testosterone the men have. Like healthy men have 10 times the testosterone as women. But testosterone is an essential sex hormone in women. And it has many of the same effects, particularly with regard to lust. Helen Fisher says testosterone is the lust hormone. And lots of, you know, animal models and human studies bear out this assertion. Women, uh, the most common indication for testosterone replacement therapy in women is low libido. And when they get more testosterone, often their sex drive increases. The problem is that in the United States, there is no FDA approved protocol to treat women for with testosterone therapy. And so clinicians who want to do this, they have to adapt a male protocol and kind of figure out how to make it work for the woman. They're essentially on their own. We need a lot more data about menstrual cycle, ovarian function, cold, and testosterone so that we can advise women wisely so that we can say, you know, these would be the times to avoid. These are the times to accentuate. And we don't know, but a woman on the USA bobsled team, 
reached out to me. The Winter Olympics is going to be in a couple of years. She's training and she says, I want to use cold exposure. I've read your work on testosterone. Sprinting is essential, you know, in my sport. How do, and of course, these Olympic athletes are scrutinized in every respect, diet, supplements. There's many things that they're not allowed to do. She says, how can I use ice baths to support my training? I said, I think we're going to need another study. I think that, you know, you're going to have to give me some, I mean, maybe it feels like intimate data, you know, you're going to have to say, well, I've done, I'm here in my cycle and I'm doing this much cold and I'm doing this much exercise and I'm monitoring my salivary test. I think we could do this if you're willing to be the human subject. Well, she used to work in bodybuilding and weightlifting. She's accustomed to all, she has an acute awareness of how her body is working. So this is great. If I have more women who were willing to talk about these experiences, willing to say, this is what I'm doing and this is the data that I'm gathering, then we could probably generate hypotheses that more women could count on. Say, this is how you get started. Everybody's body is gonna be a little bit different, but here's something that worked for another woman and you could start there and then adapt it for yourself. That's what we're shooting for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if people want to start cold exposure, are there any conditions that would stop them from doing that? And what would be the best way to start? This is just, you know, have a cold shower. Is it literally to just chuck yourself into the cold river? You know, what is what would be the protocol for a complete newbie to to start and to start playing with it? Those are wonderful examples. Um, but let's talk about the contraindications. I've written an article and I talked about dangers and safety and contraindications. And um, the only one that I'm going to mention is hypertension. So this is high blood pressure. When you go whole body, vasoconstriction um, reduces the blood flow to the limbs to try and defend your core body temperature. They say, well, we're going to allow the limbs to cool down and that will reduce the amount of heat that we lose. But where does all that blood go? Right into the head, particularly because your head is out, right into the core. And this will increase your blood pressure. If you already suffer from hypertension, then that's a contraindication to whole body cold exposure. And you should keep an eye on your blood pressure and talk to your physician about it. That's the most important one. Some people ask about heart conditions. And we've talked a little bit about how a cold shower will raise your heart rate. Uh, the dive reflex will lower your heart rate. So there's a lot going on with your heart. But I have not specifically seen a case or a physician tell me, these are the things that if you have a heart condition, you should be watching out for when you do cold exposure. And so I'm mentioning it, but I, I'm not advising. I don't give medical advice in any case. I'm an engineer. I'm not advising anyone with a specific heart condition to do it or to avoid it. But getting started, you go cold enough to gasp and long enough to shiver. If you are concerned about adverse effects or you're concerned that you won't be able to do it, you don't need to go any colder than the temperature that makes you go. <sighs> if you feel that shock, it has activated your nervous system. Your hypothalamus is looking for that brown fat and saying, get going brown fat. If your muscles start to shiver, you know your body is in a thermogenesis state. That is, it is trying to generate heat. It has stimulated your mitochondria. Your mitochondria will respond. When you're just starting out, cold enough to gasp, long enough to shiver, that might be, I don't know, 15 degrees C. You know, it, it might be 55 degrees Fahrenheit or maybe a little warmer for some people. And they get that gasp reflex and it doesn't take them more than two, three minutes. But as they acclimate, as their smooth muscle tissue responds better to the cold and they perfect their vasoconstriction, as they recruit brown fat, and it takes about 10 days for a human being, regular cold exposure to get their brown fat going. But as they recruit brown fat, they will become cold acclimated. And they'll finally reach the point of, you know, that I'm at or that Joe Rogan is at or that Scott Carney is at, where they'll get in at 39 degrees Fahrenheit, let's say four degrees C, maybe a little bit warmer. And they'll say, this is boring. You know, I, this doesn't get me going at all. I could stay in here all day. I need one degree C or 33 degrees Fahrenheit. I need the ice floating around in there. 
I never get used to it. Like when I stare at the ice, there's always some part of me that goes, you could skip a day. You know, you don't really have it. It's going to be fine. And then Joe Rogan says, kill your inner bitch. Uh, and then I get in anyway. And after 30 seconds, I'm like, what, what was I worried about? You know, this is great. This is why I do that. I love this stuff. I feel great. I do some push ups, some pull ups. I get my steel mace. I got the whole rest of my day ahead of me. But I never get used to, you know, that one degree. This happens to a lot of people. They get bored if it isn't so cold that there's ice in the water. But it takes a few weeks. For some people, a few months. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for, for me, certainly, and, and so far I'm only doing the cold showers, it is visible how quickly you sort of you build the tolerance. And what is funny as well is the skin stays red around here, just under the collarbones, these little triangles. Is that where the brown fat is? Because this stays you know, on like red for hours yeah. after. <laughs> I don't know why it's red. Like, I'm not sure what changes the color. Sometimes you call it ice tan, you know, and you can see the exact line to which someone emerged. But coincidentally, yes, your brown fat, is strategically positioned around your heart, around your neck, at the base of your neck, in between your shoulder blades. It is strategically positioned so that when your um, blood passes from your heart up to your brain, it has to go right next to the brown fat. So the brown fat will be pouring heat into the blood that is going to protect the brain first. The body didn't put brown fat, you know, in your knees or someplace like this. It put it right in the core next to the vital organs that it's trying to protect. It's it's really fascinating because in a way you would imagine that it's actually keeping warm that would be better for mitochondria because it means less work for them. But perhaps like so many of these things, it's all about that anti-fragility that we need to be able and we need to create conditions where we push ourselves physiologically because I think the modern life or modernity in general meant that across our entire lives, we don't really push ourselves um, a lot. A lot of modern technology is there to keep us comfortable, nice, warm, stable. <laughs> yep. Our ancestors, they survived the ice age. You know, the, the, when the glaciers of Mount Kilimanjaro in East Africa, and they're on the equator, you know, when those glaciers advanced during the ice age, there'd be a few thousand homo sapiens trying to eke out an existence between the ice and the ocean. And they did it at the water's edge. They did it by fishing and foraging in the water. And their bodies, if their bodies weren't cold adapted, they never would have made it. Well, what's mm. really interesting about mitochondria is they carry their own DNA and you inherit your mitochondrial DNA exclusively from your mother. The sperm has mitochondria in it and they power the action of the sperm. But as soon after the egg is fertilized, the male, that is the mitochondria that came with the sperm are destroyed. And the only mitochondria that are reproduced inside the, the zygote, the embryo, the fetus are the maternal mitochondria. That means even though our DNA in our nucleus is sexual reproduction, you get some from your dad and some from your mom, you only get maternal mitochondria. Your mitochondria, except for the rate of mutation, is identical to your mother, to your grandmother, to your great-grandmother. And here's the weird thing. The girl that, I suppose you're having a boy. I think you've already picked a name. But if you were having a girl, her eggs would form in your uterus. That is, all of her genetic information is formed while she's gestating, during pregnancy. And what this means is the mitochondria that she's passing down, they go way, way back. The, without sexual reproduction, the rate of change of mitochondrial DNA is extraordinarily slow. When was the last ice age? I'm going to say 10,000 years, 12,000 years. Not that long ago. Because the rate of change in mitochondrial DNA is so slow, we carry essentially the same mitochondrial DNA as the ancestors who survived that ice age. It is any wonder that our bodies are wired to expect cold exposure and we don't give our bodies what it expects, we lapse into a state 
of disease. Okay, so you've actually used your engineering background to create your own ice plunge. Do you want to tell us a little bit about why you felt the need to like create your own? What was missing in the market out of there that you felt you needed to improve? There was nothing that made ice. There were um, converted hot tubs, you know, that you put a chiller in and you could make the water cold. Um, but there was no such thing as an ice bath until my former student at ASU, we're both engineers, Jason Stauffer and I, uh, we were taking these ice baths and we're in Jason's backyard and, you know, it's a 115 degrees in Phoenix. So what is that? I don't know, 40 degrees C or something outrageous in Phoenix, Arizona in the summertime. And we would buy, you know, 200 pounds of ice. I don't know how you measure mass in your country. You know, in the United Kingdom, they stone and whatever this is. But you got to imagine... Yeah all of this ice and we pour it into the tank and then it felt like 15 minutes later it was all melted because it's so damn hot and if we have four or five friends then we're like well this is ridiculous i just spent an hour at the gas station and filling this stuff up we said we're engineers we ought to be able to figure this out so we built a freezer we ran some coils in the tub and we created this really ugly i mean we were proud of it at the time but it was terrible, you know, in retrospect, we created this ice bath that makes ice. We invited our friends over, we had a party and somebody said, I'd love to buy it. And we were like, well, we just made this for us, um, but I guess we'll make one for you too. We took a few pictures and I put it up on Etsy of all places. So Etsy is where you can buy like a crocheted Christmas stocking or you can buy a 350 pound ice bath. You know, at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. And some people started to find it because there was nothing in the market like this. And everybody wanted, when I say everybody, it seemed to me, you know, there was a lot of people out there who wanted that Wim Hof ice in the water experience. They didn't want a cold plunge. They wanted an ice bath. This got to Ben Greenfield because Jason took an ice bath to Burning Man. And um, people were amazed. Like, how can you make ice on the playa? And it was very popular. And somebody told Ben Greenfield, he wrote us into his boundless book before he'd even tried the Morosco. We ship him Morosco. And the first thing he did was freeze it solid. You know, he put it outside. He lives in a cold climate. It was winter. And I wound up checking the weather report in Spokane, Washington every day. You know, is it melted yet? Is Ben Greenfield going to get in this thing yet? And eventually he did. That's when business really took off. People were like, what do you mean there's a thing called an ice bath? I'd never heard of this. I've been looking for one for years. And people were coming out of the woodwork thanking us for making what I look back on now is this crappy little, you know, amateur product that didn't exist anywhere in the world. We are still the only ice bath company in the Western Hemisphere that makes ice. But if you go on Instagram, you can find like... Chinese knockoffs of Morozco knockoffs that are much cheaper. You take a chiller, you stick it in a bathtub, you know, it cools the water down, circulates it, you put a filter in there, boom, you call it an ice bath. It doesn't make ice. It doesn't go down below about 40 degrees. And I forget what that would be uh, in Celsius, but maybe six degrees Celsius, perhaps. Um, and you can get a lot of metabolic benefits and it's way less expensive. There are a hundred companies now that will try and sell you some kind of cold plunge uh, and call it an ice bath. Our ice baths now, they're so much better than when we started thermodynamically, um, water chemistry, filtration, durability of the finishes. It's because these last five years, I've become obsessed with building the world's best ice bath. It's not the fertility crisis. It's not the, the autoimmune disorders. Those are really important. But what's got me going right now is the mental health crisis in the United States. Coming out of COVID mm. and coming out of the lockdowns. And the students I see in my classroom, the suicide rates have gone up. The rates of major depression have gone up and not by a little. Drug overdoses have gone up. We are, the real pandemic is in mental health. You want to find a qualified therapist in Phoenix? You got to wait like six months. And the only reason that a slot opens up on their schedule is because some patient shot himself. 
It is a tragedy what is happening in mental health. Ice baths can help. So all the other things that we've talked about, they're important. And I care about those people. Cancer, for goodness sakes. But what keeps me going right now is how do we fix the brain? How do we reverse major depression? Because it's not possible to be depressed and have the motivation to heal your cancer. It's, you're not motivated to reverse your Hashimoto's or to lose weight if your brain doesn't have the power that it needs to get you motivated to make your life better. I want people to be able to choose their own health state. And they've got mm -hmm. to have sort of the clarity of mind to choose well for themselves. That's what I'm working on now. That's really fascinating. And I think, I mean, recently, in the last couple of years anyway, in the last maybe year, um, Chris Palmer released his book about the brain energy and he talks about the ketogenic diets and how that affects the mental health. But if both cold exposure and ketogenic di diets are affecting ketone production, um, then that's a direct link to cold exposure and the beneficial effect on the mental health. And I think a lot of cold exposure for people know that it's very good for just feeling good. So there is that direct link straight away that you know that that is just going to give you that feel good hormones. So even if they might not, I don't know, have they done the research on the cold exposure and mental health or is that still sure a little fringe? No, uh, there's nothing fringe about it. Um, part of it is, you know, you can't stay in a bad mood when you get like a two, three X dopamine hit off of your cold water immersion. I mean, you feel great. There's some good case studies. Mike Tipton from uh, the United Kingdom has written up one. Um, people who had major depression that is resistant to drug therapy, that um, don't get better with talk therapy, they start winter swimming and they get better. And so it could be the ketones. It could be just being outside. But the Chris Palmer's book, which I've read in detail, corresponded with him a little bit, posted a review. I haven't talked Chris Palmer into the ice bath yet, but I have this fantasy that, you know, eventually I'll persuade him. Chris Palmer's book takes this metabolic view. The brain is the most metabolically demanding organ in your body. And when your metabolism, when your metabolism is not right, your brain doesn't have, he calls it the energy. I'm an engineer, so I'm like, Chris, it's power, you know? But when your brain doesn't have the metabolic function that it needs, of course you lapse into low mood. Yeah, that's fascinating. Okay, so for people that want to find out more, where can they find you online? Um, you found me at seagertp.substack.org, so S-E-A-G-E-R-T-P. And I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram. Uh, I've got the book, Uncommon Cold. It just came out, and you, but it's not on Amazon. You can't get it in a bookstore. You either had to be at the CryoCon conference or you can still order it uh, from morozcoforge.com. So you can you know, find me on the internet, I'm on LinkedIn, and you can read all of my articles for free on the Morozco website. But some people like having, you know, the book in their hand. They want to write in it. And so we compiled these together, just launched it in Dallas at the CryoCon. And I think I have a hundred of these to, you know, mail out to customers or people who saw my talk and say, yeah, I want your book. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome, Pat. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for tuning in to Wisdom Rebellion. Before you go, if you enjoy the conversation, please consider subscribing. It massively helps with keeping the show on the road so we can all build a wiser world together. And if you loved this video, you will also love this one. I'll see you there.